It was stunning. It was mind blowing. Um, after the biology questions, I had them type in, you know, what do you say to a father with a sick child? And it gave this very uh, careful, uh, excellent answer that, you know, was perhaps better than any of us in the room might have given. And so I was like, wow, uh, what is it? What is the scope of this thing? Because this is way better. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm your host, Kevin Scott, Chief Technology Officer for Microsoft. In this podcast, we're going to get behind the tech. We'll talk with some of the people who have made our modern tech world possible and understand what motivated them to create what they did. So join me to maybe learn a little bit about the history of computing and get a few behind the scenes insights into what's happening today. Stick around. Hi, welcome to Behind the Tech. We have a great episode for you today uh, with a really special guest, Bill Gates, who needs no introduction given the unbelievable impact that he's had on the world of technology and the world at large over the past several decades, has been working very closely with the teams at Microsoft and OpenAI over the past handful of months, helping us think through what the amazing revolution that we're experiencing right now in AI means for OpenAI, Microsoft, all of our stakeholders, and for the world at large. Uh, I've learned so much from my conversations that I've had with Bill uh, over these past months that I thought it might be a great thing to share just a tiny little glimpse of those conversations with uh, all of you listeners today. Uh, so with that, let's uh, introduce Bill and get a great conversation started. Thank you so much for doing the show today. Uh, and I just wanted to jump right in with, you know, maybe one of the more interesting things that's happened in the past few years in technology, which is uh, GPT-4 and chat GPT and the work that uh, we've been doing together at Microsoft with OpenAI. Um, by, by the time this podcast airs, uh, OpenAI will have made their announcement to the world about gpt for, uh, but I want to sort of set the stage, uh, the unveiling of the first instance of GPT-4 outside of OpenAI was actually to you uh, last August at a dinner that you hosted with Reed and Sam Altman and Greg Brockman and Satya and a whole bunch of other folks. Um, and the, the open AI folks had been very anxious about showing you this because your bar for AI had been really high. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it had been really helpful, actually, the push that you had made on all of us for like what acceptable high ambition AI would, uh, look like. And so I, I wanted to ask you what what was that dinner like for you? What were your impressions? Like, what had you been thinking before? And, you know, like, what, if anything, changed in your mind after you had seen uh, seen GPT-4? Yeah, so AI has always been, you know, the holy grail of computer science. And, uh, you know, when I was young, Stanford Research had Shaky the Robot that was trying to pick things up. And there were various logic systems uh, that people we're working on, you know, so the dream was always some sort of reasoning capability. Um, overall progress in AI until machine learning came along was pretty modest. Um, you know, even speech recognition was just, you know, barely reasonable. Uh, and so we had that gigantic acceleration with machine learning, particularly in uh, sort of sensory things, recognizing speech, recognizing pictures, and it was phenomenal. And it just, uh, you know, kept getting better and scale was, was part of that. But we were still missing anything that had to do with complex logic, with being able to say, read a text and do what a human does, which is, quote, understand what's in that text. And so as, as Microsoft uh, was doing more with OpenAI. I had a chance to go see them myself independently a number of times, and they were doing a lot of text generation. They had a little robot arm 
the early text generation still didn't seem to have a a broad understanding, you know, like it could generate a sentence saying Joe's in Chicago and then two sentences later say Joe's in Seattle, uh, which in its local probabilistic sense, you know, is a good sentence, but, uh, you know, a human has a broad understanding of the world from both experience and reading that you understand that uh, can't be. And so as they were enthusing about uh, GPT-3 and even the early versions of GPT-4, I said to them, hey, if you can pass an advanced placement biology exam where you take a question that's not part of the training set uh, or a bunch of them and give fully recent answers, knowing that biology textbook is one of many things that's in that training corpus, then you will really get my attention because that would be a heck of a milestone. And so, you know, please work on that. I thought, you know, that would, they'd go away for two or three years because my intuition has always been that we needed to understand uh, knowledge representation and symbolic reasoning in a more explicit way uh, so that we were one or two inventions short of something where it was very good at reading and writing and therefore being an assistant. And so it was amazing that, you know, you and Greg and Sam over the summer were saying, yeah, it might not be that long before we want to come demo this thing to you because it's actually doing pretty well on uh, scientific learning. And in August, uh, they said, yeah, let's schedule this thing. And so in early September, we had a pretty large group over to my house for a dinner, I think maybe 30 people in total, including a lot of the uh, amazing OpenAI people, but a good sized group from Microsoft, Satya was there, and they gave it AP biology questions and let it me give it AP biology questions. And uh, with one exception, it, it did a super good job. And the exception had to do with math, which we can get to that later. Uh, but it was stunning. It was mind blowing. Um, after the biology questions, I had them type in, you know, what do you say to a father with a sick child? And it gave this very uh, careful, uh, excellent answer that, you know, was perhaps better than any of us in the room might have given. Uh, and and so it was like, wow, uh, what is it? What is the scope of this thing? Because this is way better. And you know, we then the rest of the night we you know ask it historical questions about you know is, are there criticisms of Churchill uh, or different things? And it was just fascinating. And then over the next few months, as I was given an account and um, Saul Khan got one of those early accounts. The idea that you could have it write college applications or, uh, you know, rewrite, say, the Declaration of Independence the way uh, a famous person like Donald Trump might have written it. And it was so capable of writing, you know, writing poems, you know, give it a, a tune like Hey Jude and tell it, you know, to write about that, uh, tell it to take a Ted Lasso episode and include the following things. Anyway, uh, you know, ever since that day in September, I've said, wow, uh, <coughs> this is a fundamental change, um, you know, not without some things that still need to be worked out, but it is a, a fundamental advance. Um, and it's confusing people in terms of, well, it can't yet do this, it can't do that, it's not perfect at this or that, but hey, this it, natural language is now the primary interface uh, that we're going to use to des describe things, even to computers. And so it's it's a huge, huge advance. Yeah, so I, I want to, like, there's so many different um, things to talk about here, but, like, maybe the first one is to talk a little bit about what, uh, what it's not good at, because the last thing that I think we want to do is give people 
the impression that it is an AGI, that it is perfect, that it that there isn't a lot of additional work that has to happen to improve it and make it better. You mentioned math as one of the things, and so I thought maybe let's talk a little bit about what you think needs to be better about these uh, systems over time and where we need to focus our energy. Yeah, so there, there appears to be a general issue that it, knowledge of context when it's being asked, okay, I tell you something and I generate something. You know, humans understand, oh, I'm making up fantasy stuff here, or I'm giving you advice that if it's wrong, you're going to buy the wrong stock or, you know, take the wrong drug. Uh, and so humans have a very deep context of what's going on. Even the AI's ability to know that you've switched context, like if you're tell, asking it to tell jokes and then you ask it a serious question where a human would sort of see from your face or the nature of that change that, okay, we're not in that joking thing. It, it wants to keep telling jokes. Yes. You almost have to re do the reset sometimes to get it out of the, hey, whatever I bring up, just make jokes about it. Uh, and so I do think that sense of context, uh, there's work. It also, in terms of how hard it should work on a problem. You know, when you and I see a math problem, we know, wow, I may have to apply simplification five or six times to get this into the right form. And so, you know, we're kind of looping through uh, how we do these reductions, whereas today, the reasoning is a sort of linear chain of descent through the levels. And if, if uh, simplification needs run 10 times, it probably won't. So. You know, math is a very abstract type of reasoning. And right now, I'd say that's the, the greatest weakness. You know, weirdly, it can solve lots of math problems. And there are some math problems where if you ask it to, to explain it in an abstract form, make essentially an equation or a program that matches the math problem, it does that perfectly. And you could pass that off to a, a normal solver, whereas if you tell it to do the numeric work itself, yeah. it often makes mistakes. And it it's very funny because sometimes it's very confident that, hey, uh, or it'll say, oh, I mistyped. Well, in fact, there's not a typewriter anywhere in this scene. So the notion of mistyping is really very weird. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, you know, whether these current areas of weakness, you know, it's six months, a year or two years before those largely get fixed. So we have a serious mode where it's not, you know, just making up URLs. And then we have a more fanciful mode. You know, there's some of that already uh, yeah. being done largely through prompts and eventually through training. Um, and, you know, training it for math, there may be some special training yep. that, that that needs to be done. But these problems, I don't think are fundamental. And, you know, there are people who think, oh, it's statistical, it can, therefore it can never do X. That is nonsense. They, you know, every example they give of a specific thing it doesn't do, you know, wait a few months. Yeah. Uh, and it, and it, it's very good. So characterizing how good it is, the people who say it's crummy are really wrong. And the people who think this is AGI, you know, they're wrong. And those of us in the middle are just, you know, trying to make sure it gets applied in the right way. There's Correct. a lot of activities like, uh, you know, helping somebody with their college application. What's my next step? What haven't I done? You know, I have the following symptoms that are in fact, you know, far within uh, the boundary of things that it it can do quite effectively. Yeah, well, I, I, I will, I, I wanna talk a little bit about this notion of it being able to use tools to assist it in reasoning. And I'll give you an example from this weekend with my daughter. So my daughter had this assignment where she had this list of 115 vocabulary words 
And uh, she had written a 1,000 word essay and her objective was to use as many of these vocabulary words as she reasonably could in this 1,000 word essay, which is sort of a ridiculous assignment on the surface, right? Um, but but she w- had written this essay and, and she was going through this list uh, trying to manually figure out like what her, you know, tally was on this uh, – vocabulary list and and you know it was boring and you know she she was like all right like I, I want the shortcut here uh like dad can you get me a chat gpt account and can i just put this in there and it will do it for me and we did it and chat gpt uh which, which is not running uh the the gpt4 model um but i don't think gpt4 would have gotten this right either uh didn't quite get it right like it was not precise but hmm. the thing then that I uh, I got her to do with me is I was like, well, let's let ChatGPT write a little Python program that can very precisely – I mean, like, this is a very simple intro CS problem uh, here. And, like, the fact that the Python code for solving that problem was perfect and I got my solution immediately, like, it's just amazing. Uh, and, like, my, my 14-year-old daughter who doesn't program understood everything that was going on. And so I, I don't know, like, if you've reflected much over these past months about, you know, like, the, because it, essentially when we are trying to solve a complicated math problem, we've got a, we've got a head full of cognitive tools that we pick up, uh, like these abstractions that you're talking about to help us break down, uh, like very complicated problems into smaller, less complicated problems that we can solve. Uh, and like, I think it, it's a very interesting idea to think about how these systems will be able to do that with code. Yeah, it's so good at writing. Uh, you know, that's just a mind blowing thing. But, you know, when you can use natural language, like, say, for a drawing program that you want various objects and you want to change them in certain ways. Sure, you still want the menus there to touch up the colors, but the primary interface for creating a, a from scratch drawing will will be language. And, and if you want a document summarized, uh, that's something that you know it can do extremely well. And so when you have large bodies of texts, um, when you have text creation problems. You know, there was a chat GPT thing where a doctor who has to write to insurance companies to explain why he thinks something should be covered, you know, that's very complicated. Uh, and it was super helpful. Now, he was reading that letter over uh, to make yep. sure it was right. In chat GPT 4, we took uh, the version 4 stuff, we took complex medical bills and we said, please explain this bill to me. What is this? And how does it relate to the, my insurance policy? And it was so incredibly helpful uh, at at being able to do that. You know, explaining concepts in a more simpler form, uh, it's very, very uh, helpful at that. And so there's going to be a lot of tasks uh, where there's just huge increased productivity, including a lot of documents, you know, payables, accounts receivables. There's Just take the health system alone. There's a lot of documents that now uh, software will be able to characterize them uh, very effectively. Yeah. So one of the other things that I wanted to to chat with you about, like you have this really unique perspective um, in – your involvement in several of the big inflection points in technology. So for two of these inflections, like you were either like, you know, one of the primary architects of the inflection itself or, you know, like one of the one of the big leaders. So like, you know, we wouldn't have the the PC uh, personal computing ecosystem without you. And like you played a, like a really uh, substantial role in getting the internet available to everybody uh, and and making it a ubiquitous technology that everyone can benefit from. Um, To me, this feels like another one of those moments where a lot of things are going to change. And, uh, you know, I I wonder, you know, what your advice might be to, you know, people who are thinking about like, oh, I have this new technology that's amazing that I can now use. Uh, Like, how, how should they be thinking about how to use it? Like, how should they be thinking about the urgency with which they are, uh, you know, pursuing these new ideas. Uh, 
and, and you know, and like, how does that relate to how you thought about uh, things in the PC era and the internet era? Yeah, so the industry starts really small, you know, where computers aren't personal, and then uh, through the microprocessor and a bunch of companies, uh, we get the personal computer, IBM, Apple, and Microsoft got to be very involved in the software, you know, even the basic interpreter on the Apple II, very obscure fact, uh, was something that I did uh, for Apple. And that idea that, wow, this is a tool that, at least for editing documents, that you have to do all the writing, uh, you know, that was pretty amazing. And then connecting those up over the internet was amazing. And then moving the computation into the mobile phone uh, was absolutely amazing. So, you know, once you get the PC, the internet, the software industry, and the mobile phone, the digital world uh, is changing huge, huge parts of our activities. Uh, I was just in India, you know, seeing this, did how they do payments digitally, even, you know, for government programs. It's an amazing application of that, that world to help uh, people who never would have bank accounts because the fees are just too high, it's, it's too complicated. And so we continue to benefit from that foundation. I do view this, the uh, beginning of computers that read and write, as every bit as profound as, as any one of those steps. And a little bit surprising because robotics has gone a little slower than I would have expected. And I don't mean autonomous driving. I think that's a special case that's particularly hard because of the open-ended environment and the difficulty of safety and what bar safety bar people will bring to that. But even factories where you actually have a huge control over yeah. the environment of what's going on and you can make sure that you know no kids are running around anywhere near that that factory. So, you know, a little bit people have saying, okay, you know, these guys can overpredict, which that's certainly correct. Uh, but here's a case where you know, we underpredicted that that natural language and its the computer's ability to deal with that and how that affects white collar jobs, including sales, service, you know, helping a doctor think through what to put in your health record. That I thought was many years off. And so all the AI books, even when they talk about things that might get a lot more productive, uh, will turn out to be wrong. And because we're just at the start of this, you could almost call it a mania like the internet mania. Yeah. But you know, the internet mania, although it had its insanities and things that, you know, I don't know, sock puppets or things where you look back and say, what were we thinking? Uh, it was a very profound tool that now we take for granted. And, you know, even just for scientific discovery, uh, you know, during the pandemic, the the utility of the immediate sharing that took place there was just phenomenal. And so this is as big a breakthrough, a milestone as I've seen in the in a whole digital uh, computer realm, uh, you know, which really starts when I'm I'm quite young. Yeah. Well, so. I'm going to say this to you, and I, I'm I'm just interested in uh, in your reaction because, uh, like you, you will always uh, like tell me when an idea is uh, dumb. But like one of the things that I've been thinking for the last handful of years is that one of the big changes that's happening because of this technology is that for 180 years from the point that Ada Lovelace wrote the first program to harness the power of a digital machine up until today, the the way that you get a digital machine to do work for you is you either have to be a skilled programmer, which is, uh, you know, like a, a, a barrier to entry that's that's not easy, or you have to have a skilled programmer anticipate the needs of the user and to build a piece of software that you can then use to get the machine to do something for you. And this may be the point where 
we get that paradigm to change a little bit where because you have this natural language interface and these AIs can write code and like they will be able to actuate a whole bunch of services and systems that, yeah, we, we sort of give ordinary people the ability to get very complicated things done with machines uh, without having to have like, the, the, all of this expertise that you and I spent many, many years, uh, you know, building. No, absolutely. Every advance, you know, hopefully lowers the bar in terms of who can easily take advantage of it. You know, the spreadsheet was an example of that because even though you still have to understand these formulas, you really didn't have to understand logic or symbols much at all. And it had the input and the output so closely connected in this grid structure that the, you didn't think about the separation of those two. And that that's kind of limiting in a way to a super abstract thinker, but it was so powerful in terms of the directness. Oh, that didn't come out right. Let me change it. Here, there's a whole class of programs of taking like corporate data and presenting it are doing complex queries against, okay, have there been any sales offices where we've had 20% of the headcount missing and is, you know, are sales results affected by that? You could just, now you don't have to go to the IT department and wait in line and have them tell you, uh, oh, that's, you know, too hard or something. Most of these corporate uh, learning things whether it's a query or a report or even a simple workflow where if something happens, you want to trigger an activity, the description in English will be the program. And when you want it to do something extra, you'll just pull out that English or whatever your language is in and type that in. And, you know, so there's a whole layer of, you know, query assistance and programming that, uh, will be accessible to any employee. And, you know, the same thing is true of, okay, I'm somewhere in the college application process and I want to know, okay, what's my next step and what's the threshold for these things? You know, it's so opaque today. So empowering people to go directly and interact uh, is, that is the theme uh, that this is trying to, uh, enable. So I wonder what some of the things are that you are most excited about, um, just in terms of application of the technology to the things that you care about deeply from the, you know, the foundation or your personal perspective. So you care a lot about education, public health, uh, climate and uh, sustainable mm -hmm. energy. Um, you, you have all of these things that you're working on and like, have you been thinking about how this technology impacts any of those things? Yeah, it's been fantastic that even going back to the fall, uh, OpenAI and Microsoft have engaged with people at uh, the Gates Foundation thinking about the health stuff and the education stuff. You know, in fact, uh, Peter Lee's going to be publishing uh, some of his thinking, which is somewhat focused on rich world health, but it's pretty yeah. obvious how that work, in a sense, is even more amazing in health systems where you have so few doctors and getting advice of any kind is is so incredibly difficult. And so it's it is incredible to look at saying, okay, can we have a personal tutor uh, that helps you out? Can you, when you write something, if you're going to some amazing school, yes, the, the teacher may go line by line and, and give you feedback, but uh, you know, a lot of kids just don't get that much feedback on the writing. And it looks like configured properly, this is a great tool to give you feedback on writing. It's also ironic in a way that, you know, people are saying, well, what does it mean that, you know, can people cheat and turn in computer uh, writing, kind of like when calculators came along, that, oh my goodness, what are we going to do about adding and, and subtracting? And of course, they did create context where you couldn't use the calculator, and they, they did 
uh, and we got we got through that without uh, it it being a a huge problem. So I think education is the most interesting application. And I think health is the second most interesting. You know, obviously there's commercial opportunity in sales and service uh, type things. And, you know, I, that'll happen. Uh, you don't need any uh, foundation uh, type engagement on that. You know, we've been, we brainstormed a lot with Saul Khan and, uh, it's you know looks very promising because a class size of thirty or twenty, you can't give a student individual attention. You can't understand their motivation or you know what keeping them engaged. They might be ahead of the class, they might be behind, and it looks like uh, in many subject areas by having this and, and having dialogues and giving feedback. Uh, for the first time, will succeed in helping education. Now, we have to admit, except for this sort of prosaic thing of looking up Wikipedia articles or helping you type <laughs> things and print them out nice, you know, the, the notion that computers were going to revolutionize education largely are still uh, more in front of us than behind us. I mean, yes, some games draw kids in, but... Uh, you know, the average math score in the U.S. hasn't gone up much uh, over the last 30 years. And so, you know, the people who do computers can't say, hey, we want credit for that. Credit for what? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's not a lot better yeah. than it was. So obviously, the, the computers didn't, uh, didn't perform some miracle there. Yeah. And I, I think over the next, you know, five to 10 years, uh, we will think of learning and how you can be helped in your learning in a very different way than just looking up material. Yeah. And I know you think about this as a global problem. Um, you know, my wife and I with our family foundation think about it as a you know local problem for disadvantaged kids. Uh, you know, like one of the common things that we see is that parent engagement makes a big difference in the educational outcomes for kids. And if you look at the children of immigrants, uh, you know, in East San Jose or East Palo Alto here in the Silicon Valley, like, you know, often the parents are working two, three jobs, like they're so busy that like they have a hard time being engaged with their kids and sometimes they don't speak English. And so like they don't even have the linguistic uh, ability. And, and you can just imagine what a technology like this could do where it really doesn't care what language you speak. It can bridge that gap between the parent and the teacher and it can you know, be there uh, to, you know, like, you know, help the parent understand, like, you know, where the roadblocks are for the child uh, and to like, you know, even potentially like get very personalized to the child's needs and sort of help them, uh, you know, on the things that they're struggling with. I, I think it's really, really very exciting. Yeah, the ling just the language barriers, you know, we often forget about that. And that comes up in developing world, India has a lot of languages. And I was at the Bangalore Research Lab as part of that trip. And, you know, they're taking these advanced technologies and trying to deal with the tail of languages. Uh, so that's not a, a huge barrier. One of the things that you said at that den at the GPT-4 dinner at your house uh, is that you had this experience early in Microsoft's history where you saw a demo that changed your way of thinking about, you know, how the personal computing industry was going to unfold and that caused you to pivot the direction of the company. I wonder if you might uh, be willing to share that with everyone. Yeah, so Xerox had made lots of money on copying machines. They got out ahead, uh, you know, their patents were there, the Japanese competition hadn't come in. And so they created a research center out in Palo Alto, uh, which was forever known by its acronym, uh, Palo Alto Research Center Park. And at Park, they assembled a incredible set of talent. Uh, Bob Taylor and others uh, were 
were very good judges of talent. So you end up with Alan Kay, Charles Simone, Butler Lampson, uh, and you know, I I don't want to leave anybody out, but there's like you know, a bunch of other people, and they create a graphics user interface machine. They weren't the only ones. There were people over in Europe doing some of these things, but they combined it with a lot of things. They put it on a network. They got a laser printer. And uh, Charles Simone was there programming this and did a, a word processor that used that very graphical bitmap screen and let you do things like fonts, you know, stuff we uh, take for granted now. And so I went and visited Charles at Park uh, at night and, you know, he demoed what he had done with this Bravo word processor. And then he printed on the laser printer a document of all the things that should be done, you know, if you ha if there were cheap pervasive computers. And he and I brainstormed that and he updated the document and printed it again. And it just blew my mind and, you know, the agenda uh, for Microsoft uh, came out of, you know, that's like in, uh, that's uh, 1979 uh, that wow. I'm with him. And computers are still, you know, completely character mode. And, uh, you know, so that's when the commitment to do software for the, the Mac emerges from Steve Jobs having a similar experience with Bob Belleville at Xerox Park, and uh, you know Park built a very Xerox built a very expensive machine uh, called the Star that they only sold a few thousand of because uh, you know people didn't think of word processing as something you would pay. You had to come in really at the low end, so PCs with first character mode, but later graphics word processing. Uh, you know, so I, I hired Charles. Charles uh, helped do Word and Excel and many of our, our great things. And eventually, you know, 15 years after Charles had shown me uh, his thinking and we'd brainstorm, we largely achieved through Windows and Office on both Windows and Mac, we'd largely achieved that piece of paper. But uh, so I, I told the group that that was the other demo that had kind of blown my mind and made me think, okay, uh, what can be achieved in the next five to 10 years? Uh, we should be more ambitious uh, taking advantage of this, this breakthrough, uh, even with the Im imperfections uh, that you know, we're going to uh, reduce over time. Yeah, it, it was a really powerful and uh, motivating anecdote that you shared. Um, so, you know, maybe one one last thing here, uh, you know, before we before we go um, or maybe two more things. So um, what do you think are the like the big grand challenges that we ought to be thinking about, uh, you know, over the next five to 10 year period? So like in a sense like this, I actually have this uh, piece of paper that Charles wrote. It's like uh, here uh, by my desk frame because like I think it was one of the more uh, like unbelievable predictions of a like technology cycle that anybody's ever written. And like I don't know why everybody doesn't know about the existence of this thing. Like it's uh, just unbelievable. Um, but, but so like, as you sort of think about like what lies ahead of us over the next five to 10 years, uh, like, you know, what, what's your challenge, not just to Microsoft, but to everybody in the world, who's going to be thinking about this? Like, what do you think we ought to go push on really, really hard? Well, there'll be a, uh, a set of innovations on how you execute these algorithms, uh, you know, lots of chips, some moving, movement from silicon to optics uh, to reduce the energy and the, the cost. So immense innovation, you know, where NVIDIA is the leader today, but others will try and challenge them as they keep getting better and, you know, using even some radical approaches because we want to get the cost of execution, execution on these things and even the training uh, dramatically less than it is today. Ideally, we'd like to move them so that often you can do them on 
a self-contained client device, not have to go up to the cloud yep. to get these uh, things. So lots to be done on the the platform that this uh, uses. Then we have an immense challenge in the software side of figuring out, okay, do you just have many specialized versions of this thing or do you have one that just keeps getting better? And you know, there'll be immense competition of uh, those two approaches, you know, even at Microsoft will pursue yeah. both in, in parallel with each other. And ideally within a contained domain, we'll get something that the accuracy is provably extremely high. Uh, by limiting the areas that it works in and by having the training data and even perhaps some pre-checking, post-checking type logic uh, that applies to that. You know, I definitely think areas like sales and service uh, that there is a lot that can be done there and that that's, uh, that's super valuable. The notion that there is this emergent capability means that the push to try and scale up even higher, uh, that'll be there. Now, what corpuses exist, uh, you know, once you get past, you know, every piece of text and video, you know, are you synthetically generating things? And do you still see that, you know, improvement um, as you scale up? Obviously, that'll uh, get pursued. And, you know, the fact that it costs billions of dollars to do that uh, won't, stand in the way of uh, that going ahead in a, a very high-speed way. And then, you know, there's a lot of societal things of, okay, where where can we uh, push it in education? It's not, it's not that it'll just immediately understand student motivation or student cognition. There'll have to be a lot of training and embedding it in an environment where you're, you know, the adults are seeing the engagement of the student and seeing the motivation. And so even though you free up the teacher from a lot of things, that personal relationship piece, uh, you, you're still going to want all the context coming out from that, those tutoring sessions to, to be visible and, and you know, help, help the dialogue that's there with the teacher or with the the patient. And so, you know, Microsoft talks about making humans more productive. So some things will be automated, but many things will just be facilitated where the final engagement is is very much a, a human, but a human who's able to get a lot more done than ever before. You know, so the number of, of challenges and opportunities uh, created by this is pretty incredible. And, you know, and I, I can see how engaged uh, the OpenAI team is by this. I'm sure there's lots of teams I don't get to see that are, you know, uh, pushing on this. And the size of the industry, I mean, when, when the microprocessors invented, the software industry was a tiny industry. I mean, we, you know, could put most of us on a panel uh, and they could complain that I work too hard and it shouldn't be allowed. Uh, you know, we could all laugh about that. You know, now this is a global industry with, uh, and so it's a, a little harder to get your hands around. I get a weekly uh, uh, digest of all the different articles about AI uh, that are, are being written. You know, oh, you know, can we use it for moral questions, which seems silly to even ask to me, but fine, people can ask whatever they want to ask. Uh, and it, so it, this thing has a, the ability to move faster because the amount of people and resources and companies is way beyond those other breakthroughs that I, I brought up and, you know, was privileged to live through. Yeah. I mean, one of, one of the things for me that has been really fascinating, and I think, you know, like I'm, I'm going to say this just as a reminder to folks who are thinking about 
pursuing careers in computer science and becoming programmers. So um, I spent most of my training as a computer scientist in my early early part of my career as a systems person. So I wrote compilers and, you know, uh, like tons of assembly language and uh, design programming languages, uh, uh, like w which I know you did as well. Uh, and I sort of feel like a lot of the things that I, uh, I studied just in terms of like, you know, parallel optimization and high performance computer architectures in grad school, I left grad school and went to Google and thought I would never use any of this stuff ever again. And then all of a sudden now, uh, like we're building supercomputers to train models and these things are relevant again. And I think, you know, it's it's interesting. Like, I, I wonder what Bill Gates, uh, the young programmer, would be working on, uh, you know, if, if you were in the mix right now, uh, like writing code for these things, because there's so many interesting things to go work on. What, what do you think you, you you as a like 20 something year old young programmer would would get really excited about in this stack of technologies? Well, they, there is an element of this that's fairly mathematical. So I feel lucky that I did a lot of math and, you know, that was a gateway to programming for me, including, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff with numerical matrices and their properties. And so there are people who, who you know, came to programming without that math background who do need to go and get a little bit of the math. I'm not saying it's super hard, yeah. but they should go and do it so that when you see those funny equations, you're like, oh, okay, uh, I'm, I'm comfortable uh, with that because a lot of the computation will be that kind of thing instead of classic programming. It is the, the paradox, you know, I, uh, when I started out, writing tiny programs was super necessary. Yeah. Like, you know, the original Macintosh is a 128K machine, 128K bytes, 22K of which is the bitmap screen. And so almost nobody could write programs that fit in there. And, and so Microsoft, our approach, our tools, we let us write code for that machine and really only we and Apple succeeded. Then when it became 512K, a few people succeeded, but even that people found very difficult. And I remember thinking, you know, as memory got to be, you know, for gigabytes, all these programmers, they don't understand <laughs> discipline and optimization. And, you know, they're just allowed to waste uh, resources. Uh, but now that, you know, these things that you're operating with billions of parameters, the idea of, okay, do I, can I skip some of those parameters? Can I simplify some of those parameters? Uh, can I pre-compute various things? You know, if I have many, many models, can I keep deltas between models instead of having them? All the kind of optimization uh, that made sense on these very resource-limited machines, well, some of them uh, come back in this world where and when you're going to do billions of operations or literally hundreds of billions of operations, uh, you know, we are pushing the absolute limit of the cost and the performance of these computers. And that's one thing that is very impressive is the speed ups, uh, even in the last six months on, on some of these things has been better than I expected. Mm. Um, and, you know, that's fantastic because you get the har hardware speed up, the software speed up, you know, kind of multiplied together. That means, uh, you know, are we, how resource bottleneck will we be over the next couple of years? Uh, that's less clear to me now that these improvements are taking place, although I still worry about that and how we make sure we, um, that companies broadly and Microsoft in particular, allocates that in a smart way. So yeah. understanding algorithms, understanding, you know, why certain things are fast and slow, uh, that is fun. You know, the systems work that in my early career is just one computer and later kind of a network of computers. Now that systems where you have data centers with millions of CPUs, it's incredible the optimization uh, that that can be done there. Just you know how the power supplies 
work or how the network connections work. And um, anyway, in almost every area of computer science, including database type techniques, programming techniques, this kind of forces us uh, to think about in a, a really new way. Yeah, I could not agree more. So last, last question. Uh, I know that you are incredibly busy and I, you know, you, you, um, you have the ability to choose to work on whatever it is that you want to work on. But I want to ask you anyway, like, what do you do outside of work uh, for fun? Uh, I ask everybody who comes on the show that. Well, that's great. I, I get to read a lot. I get to play tennis a lot. Uh, during the pandemic, I was down in California in the fall and winter, and I'm still enjoying that. Although uh, the foundations meeting in person and some of these Microsoft OpenAI meetings, it's been great that we've been able to do those in person, but some we can just do virtually. So anyway, I, I play pickleball because I've been playing for over 50 years, uh, tennis, and I, I like to read a lot. I you know, goofed off and went to the Australian Open uh, for the first time because it's nice warm weather down there and yeah. that. So, so, so I actually, I actually want to push on this idea. Of read a lot. So you, you say you read a lot, which is not the same as uh, like what most people say when they say they read a lot. You, uh, you're famous for carrying around like a giant tote bag of books with you everywhere you go, and you read a insane amount of stuff. Uh, you have everything from like really difficult science books, uh, you know, all the way to fiction. So, like, how much do you actually read? Uh, like, what's what's a typical uh, pace of reading for Bill Gates? You know, if I don't read a book in a week, then I'm really, I can re-look at what I was doing that week. If I'm, ba I'm on vacation, then I'll, you know, hope to read more like five, six, or seven. Of course, books are quite variable uh, in, in size. You know, over the course of the year, you know, I should be able to read close to 80 plus books, you know, I have a, a younger children uh, who read even more than I do. So it's kind of like, oh, geez, uh, you know, I, I have to be, uh, you know, which solo books am I going to read? I still, you know, read all the Schmiel, uh, Pinker, you know, some authors that are just so profound and have, have shaped my thinking. But, you know, reading is kind of relaxing. I should read more fiction. When I'm, I fall behind, my nonfiction list tends to dominate. Uh, and yet, you know, that people have suggested such good fiction stuff to me. And that's why, you know, I kind of share my reading list on, on Gates Notes. And yeah. so what, what's the uh, what's the over under uh, you? You're famous for uh, saying that you want to read uh, David Foster Wallace's uh, Infinite Jest, like over under uh, that happening in 23. Well, <laughs> if there hadn't been this darn AI advance, that's distracting <laughs> me. I'm, I'm kidding you, but it's it really true. I have allocated uh, and with super excitement, a lot more time yeah. to you know, sitting with Microsoft product groups and saying, okay, what does this mean for security? What does it mean for Office? What does it mean for our database type thing? Because I love that type of brainstorming because new vistas are opened up. So, no, it's it's all your fault. Uh, no <laughs> infinite jest this year. Excellent. Well, I, I appreciate you making that trade because it's been really fantastic <laughs> over the past six months having you uh, help us think through all of this stuff. So thank you for that. And thank you for uh, doing the podcast today. Really, really appreciate it. No, it's fun, Kevin. Thanks so much. Thank you so much to Bill for being with us here today. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. Um, yeah, there, there's so many great things about this conversation, uh, which were reflections of the conversations that we've been having with Bill over the past handful of months as we think through this amazing revolution. Uh, one of the things that I've learned most from Bill over the past handful of uh, months as we think about what AI means for the future is how he thought about what personal computing and the 
uh, microprocessor and PC operating system revolution uh, meant for the world when he was building Microsoft from the ground up. Uh, and even like what it felt like for him as one of the leaders helping bring the internet revolution to the world. Uh, yeah, so like those parts of the conversation today that we had where he was recounting some of his experiences, like the uh, the first meeting that he had with Charles Simone at Xerox Park, uh, where he saw one of the world's first graphical word processors and like how seeing that and talking with Charles influenced uh, an enormous amount of the history of not just Microsoft, but the world in the uh, subsequent years. Um, and, and just hearing Bill talk about his uh, passion for the things that the Gates Foundation is doing and what these AI technologies mean for those things, like how uh, maybe we can use these technologies to accelerate some of the benefits to the people in the world who are most in need of technologies like this to help them live uh, better and more successful lives. Um, so again, a, just a tremendous treat for uh, being able to talk with Bill on the podcast today. If you have anything you'd like to share with us, please email anytime at behindthetech at microsoft.com. You can follow Behind the Tech on your favorite podcast platform or check out full video episodes on YouTube. Thanks for tuning in and see you next time.